All right. So welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Tonight, I have Robert Miller. And guess what, guys? He's a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Keisha. Welcome, Robert. How are you? Everything is great. Thanks so much for having me on. Good. Thanks for coming on. I'm excited to talk to you. So I want to ask you, what's your favorite genre of music? My favorite genre? Uh, I, I go towards two things, the British invasion stuff that took place in the 60s, because mm -hmm. I kind of lived through that, and jazz fusion, which is really where my writing is nowadays. Oh, okay, nice. So how did you fall in love with music? Was it like when you were a kid? Was someone always playing music? Like, where did it come from? I think it was in the womb. <laughs> my, my father was a musician. My father played the trumpet, mm -hmm. um, pretty much self-taught. And um, when I was born, uh, he told me later that he decided that I was going to be a musician. So I had no choice in the matter. Um, and when I was about, I don't know, six years old or so, my parents said to me, pick an instrument. And at six years of age, I had no idea. So they started me out on piano. Uh, which is a great instrument to start on. But, you know, as a six-year-old, who wants to stay in and practice, right? Yeah. So I, I took piano lessons for about a year, and I, I really hated it. I just didn't want to practice. And uh, they said to me, okay, um, that's all right. You can give up piano, but you have to do something else. Mm -hmm. So I switched to trumpet because that was what my father was doing. And I played trumpet for the next, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years through uh, high school. Um, but in the middle of all of that, um, this little band came out of England called the Beatles. And that kind of made the trumpet not too cool anymore. Um, so I learned how to play guitar and bass on my own. And that started me on my journey professionally. Wow. So what does a part-time musician's life look like? Uh, a part-time musician's life is just that you're, you know, in my early 20s, I thought I was going to be a rock star. I thought I was going to do music full-time, but, you know, like so many people, life intervened. What do I mean? Well, I graduated college. I had to find a job. I got a job, you know, in, in the mailroom of a public television station in Boston, and I thought that that was going to last for about a month or two, and then I'd kind of get up into the production side of TV. But as uh, bad luck would have it, nothing opened up, and I got stuck in the mailroom. I'm playing music in the evening between the two jobs. If I was making $100 a week, it was, it was a lot of money. And I, I had a girlfriend, and we got married. And then you know, a few years later, we had children. And then you have a, a rental or you buy something, you have a mortgage. So music became more like an avocation for me, more like a hobby, even though that's not what I wanted. I wanted it to be full time, but it just wasn't practical. And I think that so many people start out with a dream and just find that, like me, life gets in the way and the dream starts to fade. Maybe it gets abandoned. But I was lucky because it was decades later, but I finally got back to it and it's worked out pretty well for me. So um, let me see. All right. So what is the one thing that you became really good at or hated to do the most at your full-time job that shows up indirectly in your life as a musician today? Gee, that's a great question. Well, uh, I, I became a lawyer. Don't hate me for that. Robert, what the hell? That is amazing. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I became a lawyer because somebody convinced me that I was going to be able to do law during the day and play music at night. Don't believe them if anybody ever tells you that, okay? Because it didn't work out at all. And uh, But, you know, when you're a lawyer, at least the areas that I was in, it was like a lot of fighting. And I always hated that. I'm a lover, not a fighter. And one of the things that I did when I got into music finally full time, I, I went to the opposite end. So everything now in my life is about, you know, peace and music and harmony, it, all, the, all the higher echelon things in life. 
which is completely the opposite of the way I had to be when I was a lawyer. So that's kind of how my journey went. Okay, so you hated that fighting. So now in your musical life, you just avoid any of that type of foolishness. Exactly. I mean, music is a, is a terribly difficult profession, okay? Because, you know, uh, there's a generation or two that's been taught that music is free. And it used to be that, you know, you would record an album and you'd go on tour to try and sell the album. Now you kind of give away your music because, you know, anybody can go on to Spotify and just be able to get whatever music they want for free. So it makes it really, really hard to be a musician. You have to love what you do. And for me, the creative side of it, which is writing and arranging and having my band and having something that came out of you know, my, my mind or my heart evolve into a finished product, it's a wonderful experience. Okay. So what were the steps that you took to start your band and get things going at this stage in your life? And were people like, Robert, you're crazy. I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to be in the band. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> there are a lot of people that said, Robert, you're crazy. Yes, you've got that right. <laughs> um, well, look, my journey was that it, it was only when I was in my early 60s that I finally decided enough was enough and I wanted to be a musician full time. And I jumped into the deep end of the pool, okay? And it was the best decision that I had made. You know, as I said before, I had spent many, many years kind of being a part-time musician. I was playing, but I was not playing at the level that I wanted. I wasn't creating at the level that I wanted. And it was frustrating. It was terribly frustrating. There's, there's nothing worse than having a dream. And you just know that you haven't gone for it. You really haven't taken your best shot. And that's kind of where I was at. When I, when, I, when I turned 60, I said to myself, okay, what am I waiting for? This is the time when I've got to do it. And the first thing that I did was I had a band that I had started several years earlier, but it wasn't going anywhere. And I decided that I needed to kind of reform the band. And I'm based in New York City. So fortunately, there's a big pool of musicians in New York City. And I started to meet some musicians and was able to start to accumulate a group of young, extremely talented, mainly foreign born musicians that had come to America and to New York City to kind of make their mark. And I had myself surrounded by them, okay? And the reason I did that was because I wanted their youth, I wanted their vibrancy, I wanted their energy. I didn't want it to be you know, some old guy was playing music or something. I wanted to be as current as possible. And everybody that I brought into the band kind of picked up on that. And my goal was to lift them up at the same time. And I think we've succeeded at that. Wow. So what was the hardest part of transitioning into this new lifestyle? Uh, the hardest part was, uh, first of all, you know, Music industry is a young person's game. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, I've gone at it exactly backwards from everybody else. I mean, I don't know anyone that was my age that decided now was the time that they were going to go into music. So a lot of people thought I was crazy. And for the longest time, I didn't tell anybody about my background. I didn't tell anybody about my age or anything because I felt that I had to establish my music credibility. And you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is that it's been five years since I went into this full time. And what I've accomplished is we've got nine albums, including a billboard number one. We've got over 4 million video views, over a million Spotify streams, over 50,000 Facebook fans. We've played festivals and concerts in the US and abroad. I've opened for uh, acts like Boney James, and uh, Edgar Winter and Blues Traveler. Um, it, it's like living la vida loca, okay? Mm. And so I'm very proud of that. And at the same time, I don't wanna make it seem like it was a straight path because it's never a straight path. You start off playing you know, in clubs and in other venues where it's, it's you and the waitress <laughs> that's in the place. 
And you have to, you know, you have to build up. It's like anything else. And it's, it's one step forward. It's two steps back. It's three steps sideways. Nothing is a straight line. So you have to be willing to, you know, deal with the slings and arrows of whatever it is that you've chosen to do. And I knew that going in. Okay. When did you feel that you were successfully living your dream? Like what was the defining moment? I had, I had an aha moment, um, uh, an oh hell yes moment. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, we were playing at a festival in Serbia, in Eastern Europe. And uh, it took us about 16 hours to get there because we had come from playing another festival in Norway, eight hours of a flight, another eight hours of a van ride from the airport in Kosovo through three countries in order to get to Serbia. We get there that morning, we're going on that evening. We go on the stage and there's 20,000 people that are in the audience. They don't know us, they barely speak English, but by the end of our set, they're all up and cheering like crazy for us. And I said, I've made it. <laughs> oh my God. So is your family supportive of your dream and what you're doing? Yes, they are, they are very, very supportive. I've got two grown daughters, they're both married. I've got a couple of grandchildren. My grandchildren love it. Um, they come to see me play. Um, in, in fact, my grandson who, who just turned three, he's now playing guitar everywhere. We got him a little guitar. He wants to be a rock and roll star. And I'm trying to you know, make sure that he goes in that direction. My wife has been incredible. Um, so I've been very fortunate in that I've had a lot of uh, success and a, a lot of encouragement from my family. That is so beautiful, I love it. So what advice would you give to struggling musicians? Well, like I said, music is a tough field, just like all the arts. I mean, there's a reason why you see so many uh, would-be artists and actors and you know they're, they're waiting on tables and stuff like that. Um, you just have to stick to it. Um, and you gotta try your best. There's no guarantee that anything is gonna work. And you have to also decide what are your standards for success? If you want to be a Broadway star, it's a little bit different than if you just want to be in a play off Broadway or something like that. Um, I didn't start out with a given set of end goals. I just knew that I wanted to play. I wanted to write music, which I've done. I now have a catalog of about 100 songs um, that I've written over the last five or six years. And so I think the answer to your question is, you just have to keep at it and you have to be willing to fail because, and you gotta be willing to take rejection. I mean, we've, I've had plenty of rejection in music, um, but you just have to smile and say, okay, it's just part of the game. Okay, so be getting the rejection, um, what made you feel like, I don't care what these people say, I'm just gonna keep going. Like, is it just the passion that you have for, you know, music, or is it something like inside you telling you that this is your path? Like, what is that that keeps you going even when you get like 10 no's? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I got to knock myself on the head about that. I look, I think you're right. It, it has to come from within. You, you have to have a desire and you have to be willing to say, look, I, I'm, I'm going to do this regardless of whether everyone or anyone likes it, you kind of know whether things are going in the right direction. I, I, I never want to fool myself. I don't think anybody wants to fool themselves, but I'm a big advocate of people following their dream. You know, we all start out with dreams in life, particularly when we're youngsters or teenagers, people dream big, okay? There's very few teenagers that say, my dream is to become an accountant. OK, <laughs> they want to be an astronaut. They want to be a baseball player. They want to be an artist. And what happens? Um, life gets in the way like it did with me. And you fall into something and then you meet somebody and, you know, one thing leads to another and your dream starts to fade or maybe you abandon your dream. But we all have those dreams. And I'm a big advocate that 
we want to, at some point in our lives, go for it. I don't think you ever want to look back on your life and say, you know what, I really should have tried X, Y, or Z. That was what I wanted to do. I never even gave it a shot. And there's no guarantee of success. It's not like you know going in that you're going to be a big success at whatever that dream is. But there's such an inner satisfaction and joy in at least trying and going for it. And I contend that, you know, to me, the best way to do that, you have to have a real, realistic dream, of course. You know, if, if my dream was to be a professional baseball player when I was 60 years old, that wasn't going to work out too well. Um, but, you know, you have to start out with, as I think, um, an action plan, baby steps. What is it do I want to do? Well, how do I start out? I don't have to have it all mapped out completely, but at least I have to know what are my first steps? If I want to open a business, if I want to start a hobby, if I want to go into a profession, what do I need to do in order to kind of put myself on the path? And then I have to recognize, like we said before, nothing in life is a straight path. So I have to be willing to adjust what happens. And at the end, I also have to be able to kind of measure my success at whatever it is that I'm doing. Does it make sense? Should I continue? Um, have I crossed a, a few thresholds? Have I accomplished any of the goals that I set? Is this working out? If it is, great. And even if it's not, you have the satisfaction of knowing that you tried. Yeah, absolutely. So have you discovered any other passions at this stage of your life, even within the music industry besides playing? Uh, well, in music, the, I'm doing other things as well. Um, you know, music is used in a variety of contexts. And one of the things I'm doing during the pandemic is getting myself ready to uh, put my music out into the sync licensing world, meaning using music in TV and film and ads. I haven't done that before. Um, I have some people talking to me about maybe starting a podcast. What do you think of that? Yeah, do it, Robert. <laughs> so I'm, I'm considering that, and I continue to write. I mean, that to me is my outlet. In fact, I, I was able to write and record a new album over the summer in the midst of the pandemic. And if I may show it to you, this is the album. It's That's called awesome. Summer of Love. I called it the summer of love. And I know some people think, what, what are you talking about? We were in a pandemic, <laughs> what kind of love? But you know, I felt Keisha that what will get us through this pandemic aside from music is love. Love is the strongest emotion we have. And so all the songs that I wrote for this album and we recorded everything remotely because that's the only way we could do it. They all have a theme that either has to do with getting through the pandemic and or the love that you need to have and feel and give in order to help you get through this kind of a time. Yeah. So that's what I did. Okay. So do you feel like you are living your best life and walking in your purpose? 110%. This is it. <laughs> Um, this is what I always wanted to do. It's worked out beyond my wildest expectations so far. I couldn't be happier. You know, it's not about uh, me trying to have a number one record in the world. It's not about, you know, me trying to be on the biggest stage in the world. It's me doing what I want to do, doing it at a high level, doing it with other people and feeling very, very good about the whole situation. I love that. So shit, this is the Oh Hell No podcast. I always ask my guests to share an Oh Hell No moment. So I'd like to know um, what is your latest Oh Hell No moment? Um, it could be a moment that taught you something or changed your perspective on something. It changed my perspective. Well, I'll tell you, just the, the, just the concept of I've been locked in like everybody into one location um, for the last, I don't know, 10 months now. Right. Um, and I never thought that that would ever happen. I mean, I haven't been able to play with my band. We haven't been able to do the kind of touring that we're used to doing, the recordings, all of those things. So, it, I mean, it could have driven me crazy. But again, I think you adjust. 
and I've adjusted as best as I can. So it was kind of my oh hell no, you know, situation, but I tried to make it into oh hell yes. That's right. All right, Robert, um, please tell us where we can download your music or buy your music or keep up with you when things open back up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, the name of my band is Project Grand Slam. So the best way to get in touch with me is uh, to follow us at projectgrandslam.com. Uh, we also have a store where we have all of our music. It's called, that's easier. It's called the PGS store. And I have a gift that I'd like to offer to your viewers, if I may. This is the record that we luckily finished just before the world closed down. It's called East Side Sessions. And if anybody that's watching goes to our store, again, the pgsstore.com, and they click on East Side Sessions and, it, and, and they enter the code DREAM, they get this album for free. Nice. And they can take a look and a listen to all the other stuff that we've done as well. But I wanted to be able to give people uh, something to remember me by and to uh, give your audience a gift for this podcast. Thanks, Robert. I love that. I'm going to be your first download. <laughs> You got it. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. I love Robert's story because it's so in line with why I started this podcast. We are never too old to follow our dreams and our passions, and he is living proof. So thank you so much, Robert. You have that totally right. And thank you so much, Keisha, for having me. Yeah, absolutely.